Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Fraternity Foodie. My name is Mike Ayalon with Greek University. And of course, there's nothing like great food that brings people together. So in these interviews, we're going to tackle some really tough conversations, but we're also going to get the inside scoop on where our guests like to eat and where we can go to get their favorite meal. So stay tuned. Towards the end, we're going to cover that. Today, we have an amazing guest. I am so excited about this. I've been thinking about this all weekend, about this great opportunity we have. Today we have with us Sid Dunn, who in my opinion is a giant in the fraternity community, somebody who we all owe a debt of gratitude for the work, the lifetime uh, worth of work that he's put into fraternity and sorority. So I'm so excited. Thank you, Sid. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to uh, talk a little bit about fraternity because uh, uh, it's been my life, uh, my entire adult life has been involved with fraternity. I really appreciate that, and it's my goal to document all of this stuff so that way future generations can look at these interviews and try and figure out what do we need to do to make sure that fraternity stays relevant and that fraternity is successful, because I know just like you, we want our children, our grandchildren to also have the same great experiences that we both have, of course. So let's start here, and uh, I think a great first question for you is, how is fraternity different today from when you joined API at Wayne State? Well, I, I joined in 1965, so you, you have to turn the calendar back and think of uh, communications. Probably the biggest uh, difference is communication. Uh, today, um, brothers can contact each other by text, by phone, by in person. Back in uh, 1965, uh, you had to make an effort to see your fraternity brothers. We, Wayne State's a commuter school, and at the time I joined, we did not have a uh, fraternity house. So we used to meet in the student union, and we had some tables set aside at the student union. And uh, in between classes, we would just hang out in the union and talk to each other. And then once a week, we'd have meetings and so on, but that once a week was never enough. It was always uh, the opportunity to interact with your brothers uh, in a casual uh, environment, also involving food because it was the student union cafeteria. So. Yeah, you bring up a great point. I mean, without cell phones, if your brothers weren't out wherever it was you were supposed to meet them, that was it. I mean, you that weren't it, going right. to be able to reach them. That's exactly right. <laughs> it is very interesting. For all the blessings that technology gives us, it's interesting to think about what it was like before then, um, certainly from a, a social media standpoint, from a risk management standpoint. Um, there weren't cameras and video cameras just about Correct. everywhere where the chapter was gathered. Right. Exactly, exactly right. And, and um, years, years later, when we uh, formed uh, FRMT, or before that FIPG, the uh, Risk Management Association, um, uh, it was a matter of creating a policy and not even knowing if the policy could could be enforced because it, it was up to the undergraduates to, to just to enforce a policy that uh, was just out there and there was no way of verifying incidents uh, the way we can do it today. Right. All right. So you worked at AEPI in various capacities for 37 years, and that absolutely blows me away. I think that's incredible, especially today when it seems like there's so much turnover in the fraternal world. So what are you most proud of uh, during your time working at AEPI? Well, when I joined, when I came back on staff in 1974, I traveled for the fraternity in 1967 to 69. Then I came back on staff after teaching school for five years in 74 as the executive secretary. And um, my goal was um, to bring the uh, AEPI back to its Jewish uh, heritage, its Jewish, Jewish roots. And uh, 1968, when I was traveling, we were up to 110 chapters. Most of them were Jewish. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, by 1974, when I came back, we were down to 45 chapters, of which only um, 30 were predominantly Jewish. Uh, still a historically Jewish fraternity, but our membership had, had strayed. And uh, one of the reasons was uh, the do-your-own-thing era, the Vietnam War years, where so many chapters closed and groups were trying to stay alive so they wouldn't lose their fraternity houses. We lost almost half of our fraternity houses during a six-year period. Wow. So when I came back uh, and with a group of alumni who supported the concept, uh, we decided that 
if we're going to exist as a fraternity, we should exist as a Jewish fraternity because there was no need for another uh, Sigma Chi, SAE, Teak, Sigma Pi. Uh, those, were, those groups were doing fine on their own. And uh, if that's all we were going to be, we would never be anything more than second rate. And so we developed a mission statement and uh, to be the North American uh, Jewish fraternity um, and to a attract men of goodwill who wanted that type of experience, but not specifically just Jewish men, but any man who wanted to be part of a historically Jewish organization. Um, I'm proud to say that when I retired in 2004, uh, we had gone from 45 chapters to 120 chapters, and uh, almost all of the chapters, if not all of them, were, were strongly Jewish or completely Jewish, uh, meeting the original mission of our founders. So that was probably the thing I'm most proud of. That is incredible work. And uh, a lot of people might not realize that a lot of organizations, whether we're talking about multicultural organizations, we're talking about organizations like AEPI, many of them started because the members themselves weren't being accepted into the other fraternities that were on campus at that exactly particular right. time. So it just exactly necessitated right. a need to be with other people where you would be accepted. That's, that's correct. And in fact, AEPI proudly has never had a Jewish clause where some fraternities had a had a restrictive uh, religious clause. API never had one. It just developed that way because the founders were all Jewish and they expanded to campuses where there were significant Jewish populations to draw from. Yeah, that's really interesting. Sigma Pi, for example, we had a restrictive clause. If you go back to the 30s, for example, that was, of course, removed and then membership was open. So it is kind of interesting how these organizations have matured as they've come forward till today. Yeah. Uh, now, you and I, we met while you were the executive director of what's called FEA, or the Fraternity Executives Association. And essentially, this is an association where all the executives from all the fraternities and sororities would regularly meet and also discuss the issues of the day so that way we can find solutions together. That really was the main focus of FEA, which is why sometimes I laugh when I see organizations fighting on a local campus because the reality right. is on a national level, we're all working together to try to find solutions. Correct. Uh, so that's really important, I think, for a lot of the undergraduates that might be listening today. Um, so I guess my question for you is, what was challenging about your position at FEA and what were some of the high points that were accomplished? Probably the most challenging part of being the executive director of a group of 84 executive directors is that each of them in their own organizations were the leaders, were the, uh, the uh, staff leaders of their organization. And they come together to trade ideas, to exchange uh, uh, the, the thoughts of, uh, on, on a very, uh, various topics. And it was challenging because they all knew what I did. I knew what they did because I had done it for over 30 years. And uh, you were always on your toes because some executive would always say, well, we're doing it this way at our organization. And why aren't we looking at it in, in that regard. So I think that was the challenge was that with a volunteer board, they all have their lives outside the fraternity and they come together either on conference calls or, 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 or uh, uh, business meetings uh, in person, conventions, conclaves, and offer thoughts. But when you're working with the executive directors who deal with this as a profession daily, uh, the pressure is on to be really at the top of your game. Yeah. That is really interesting. Um, you know, the other thing that I think about too is, and many people might not know this about you, you actually received an award from the White House under George W. Bush called the President's Call to Service Award. And you were given this award because you logged over 4,000 hours of volunteer service to your synagogue. And obviously your Jewish faith is very important to you as it is for me as well. Um, and there are a lot of different ways that we can give back. Um, so I guess my question is, what makes you want to give back to the Jewish community in that particular way? Well, I, uh, I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish home. I went to, uh, for the first nine years of my schooling, I went to an Orthodox yeshiva, which is a Hebrew parochial school uh, in Detroit. And um, it became part of my life. It became who I am. Um, so when I came to Wayne State, 
there was very little thought that I would join anything but a Jewish fraternity. Um, the, the funny aside, I guess, uh, I rushed uh, four for There were four Jewish fraternities. I rushed four of them. Uh, only one gave me a bid was uh, a pi. I had wanted to, to join Sammy, uh, Sigma Alpha Mu. Uh, so in uh, two years ago, two or three years ago, I received the Interfraternal Service Award from Sigma Alpha Mu. And part of the award is a Sammy pin uh, on a plaque and mounted on a plaque. So it took me about 51 years to get my Sammy pin, uh, but uh, I'm certainly uh, very pleased with uh, the choice of a pie. Regarding, regarding uh, the concept of, of uh, working for Jewish organizations and my identity as, as a Jewish man, my wife, by the way, also received the award. She spent time working with Sisterhood, uh, and uh, with the or and with uh, our synagogue, and uh, so she also received a uh, uh, call to service award from the White House Office of Faith-Based Initiatives. Uh, but it's very important to me. My children uh, both uh, joined uh, a Jewish sorority. Um, my one of my daughters uh, was a BBYO advisor of B'nai B'rith Youth Organization, uh, a B'nai B'rith Girls advisor for ten years. Another now works for the Federation. Um, in uh, Houston, Texas, uh, and um, has served as uh, the vice chair of Repair the World, which is a Jewish organization, uh, a, a multiple Jewish organ, uh, multiple Jewish organizations um, serve with uh, Repair the World as the umbrella uh, to do good in the world. And so, uh, the proudest thing I am is yes, I've served my synagogue. Yes, I I continue working for my my uh, for Jewish causes but the fact that my children have and my now my grandchildren um, uh, have a Jewish education and are developing that that's very important to me yeah I identify with your story a great deal uh, I went to Solomon Schechter for first through eighth grade so certainly that's a big part of my upbringing um, and that's certainly something that I think about when I look at my kids um, and then your story about Sammy is also interesting to me as well. I, I think about all the men that perhaps wanted to join an organization but didn't, maybe because they knew that perhaps there was hazing going on in a particular organization and they shied away from that organization and went to maybe another fraternity that didn't haze, for example. Right. And all of those missed opportunities maybe for people who didn't get invitations to join for one reason or another, but would have been spectacular brothers. Absolutely. When you look back on it now, uh, they would have been amazing. And there's so many yeah. stories like that. I mean, there's not enough time to get into what could have been, right? Not in a half an hour, no. <laughs> not in a half hour, certainly not. Um, and so, you know, something as a, as a Jewish man, I'm sure you're very aware, anti-Semitism is clearly on the rise here in the United States and quite frankly, all over the world. You look at places like Germany um, and other places around the world. And we also see that AE Pi houses, in many, in many cases, they're vandalized across the country um, as a result of some of this anti-Semitism that's happening on college campuses. As a matter of fact, I live just outside of Nashville, and I actually saw that a recent incident happened at the AE Pi house Vanderbilt. at Vanderbilt, right here in Nashville. So how do we stop this on college campuses? Um, there's evil in the world, and the acts of anti-Semitism are an example of such evil. Um, the ADL reported that there were almost 2,000 incidents of anti-Semitism in 2017, and that's a 57% annual increase from the year before. So it's definitely increasing. Uh, in late July, for example, just five weeks after I left the office of, uh, uh, left the, office of the president of my synagogue, uh, two vandals painted flags on the property of my synagogue, Congregation Shari Tefila. Uh, barely three months later in October, I heard the news about a shooting at Pittsburgh, at the Tree of Life Synagogue, which happened while on, on the Sabbath, while I was at our synagogue celebrating a bat mitzvah. Our rabbi uh, said it best at the time, our country is becoming meaner and cruder as we become less and less connected to our religious values. It's not an issue of mental health or guns it's an issue that there are evil people in the world uh, who seek to divide rather than unite. Uh, Edmund Burke, the British philosopher said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Um, it, it will, it, it, it's something that 
is continuing to happen. Good men have to join together to combat it. And um, it, it's gone on for millennia. I, I think it would be hubris to think that we could just stop it because we'll stop it now. But um, something, uh, some things just uh, unfortunately never change. And anti-Semitism unfortunately happens to be one of them. Wow. Your words are so important and you're absolutely right in that good people have to stand up and say something about it is the most important thing to talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, now, certainly you've seen all the problems within fraternity and sorority life. I'm not telling you anything new uh, when you see those headlines across the country. So if you could speak to all of today's undergraduates, what should they be doing differently in order to ensure the long-term success and relevance of fraternity? I think uh, they should be doing what fraternities have been doing for so many years, and that is uh, interacting with your brothers in positive ways, uh, using the fraternity as a vehicle for community service, uh, for a social outlet, but also for doing good for others. Um, you can't be good unless you do good. There's just no way. Uh, so for undergraduates to uh, follow the ritual, to listen to, um, to the, the concepts uh, that, that are expounded in the ritual, uh, that's really what they need to do. And uh, the rest of it will, uh, will come. Uh, communication, as I said earlier, is a, big, is a big part of how we interact today. Um, you, can go, you can go hours in, in a fraternity house and not see anybody because you're in your room on the computer, you're in your room on your phone, you're somewhere else on your phone. So, uh, just the interaction, uh, having meals together, um, having uh, social activities together, having community service activities together, that really is what is going to bind the fraternity to the positive values of the ritual. Yeah. You mentioned having meals together. That's another interesting thing that I look at that's so different uh, from today, from years past. Um, it used to be that we had meals together all the time, but now, I mean, in this society where everybody's on the go constantly, uh, breakfast is usually a granola bar on the way out the door. Um, and, you know, even just having lunch and dinner together, it just seems uh, that it's not something that we stress uh, any importance on. And, and maybe we ought to look at that and try and figure out how do we commit to at least improving the amount of time that we're spending with our brothers. Um, it might not be dinner every night, but maybe we can do it twice a week or something like that. That was an issue that, that really happened while I was uh, near the end of my career as a fraternity executive. Um, we, we went to catering services instead of the cook. Uh, you know, the fraternity cook uh, became legendary because if you're an alumnus coming back to the chapter house to visit the house, yeah, there's a whole bunch of guys there that you never met, but you knew the cook, you knew the house mother. Sure. And those, those little touchstones uh, became uh, important for alumni to re-engage with their fraternity. Uh, and and uh, that, that's sadly something that doesn't happen now. We have yeah. catering services and fraternity houses, uh, different people, uh, uh, you know, it, one, of the, one of the jobs in fraternity house in sorority houses uh, in the 60s and 70s, one of the prize jobs was to become a hasher at a sorority house. If you were a fraternity man and you could hash at a sorority house, you were like, like you were like a king, and uh, and and that means just bussing tables and serving a sorority, you know sorority house. So uh, that's 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 gone in uh, in that regard, and uh, it's sad that that's uh, another uh, another touchstone of fraternity that's missing uh, in today's world. Yeah, I agree. We have to get back to some of that. Now, certainly with somebody like yourself, who's had such a long and distinguished career within fraternity, there's no doubt that you have had some people, whether it be within AEPI or maybe even in other organizations that you looked up to and people who shaped who you are today. So who are a couple of those people and why do they mean so much to you? Well, when you say a couple, it makes it very challenging. Yeah. Uh, especially if any of them see it, but uh, most of the people that influenced my fraternity career have passed on. Uh, 
two of them, I was fortunate. Uh, our fraternity was founded in 1913. We're a 20th century fraternity. And so I was fortunate when I took over in 1974 and came back uh, to meet two of our founders, to two living founders, um, and both of whom had done very, very well in life. And one lived into, into his 90s and came to conventions uh, up through the 1980, uh, I think 87 might have been his last convention. So when you think of, we were founded in 1913 and, and so on, he was in his uh, mid to late 90s. But those were two people who certainly influenced me. Uh, the person who hired me as a, as a undergraduate uh, to become a field secretary or chapter consultant these days, uh, George Toll was certainly one who uh, was legendary, became an FEA president and uh, uh, NIC uh, uh, silver medalist and, and so on. Uh, FEA Distinguished Service Award. So he was he was another. And then from a volunteer standpoint, uh, uh, Ed Gold was my mentor as an undergraduate, got me involved in the national fraternity. Phil Cohen was the first president when I was the executive director. And so we started moving the fraternity back to its Jewish roots. And then there are so many others. And the, in the inner fraternity world, Bill Schwartz from Sigma Alpha Mu, uh, we became very close friends. Um, Jim Greer from Zeta Beta Ta, uh, but uh, people like uh, uh, Mo Littlefield from Sigma Nu and George Spazic from Lambda Chi Alpha. I mean, you go down the list uh, of uh, of inner fraternal names, and there's just so many that uh, leaving not mentioning one shouldn't diminish the thought that these others are just were influential to me. Yeah, you're probably going to get some letters from the ones that you, you know. Left. You know of these names, and and uh, and you have your, and I know you you have your own heroes. Of course, of course, we all have our own heroes, and I'm sure you're going to get some letters from the ones that weren't included. Well, okay. maybe, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, obviously, you've been engaged with fraternity for a very long time. How do we keep more of our fraternity and sorority alumni engaged? over a lifetime, because it seems to me that many of the undergraduates that I meet, fraternity is something that they do in college, but once they graduate, that's it. So how do we keep them engaged? Most actively involved alumni will tell you that their undergraduate experience offered them leadership opportunities that transcend the fraternity. And other organizations reap the benefit. If you think about churches and civic and charitable organizations, all of them gain because of the leaderships, leadership skills that, that one learns uh, in, in a fraternity chapter. Uh, so if I'm talking to fraternity undergraduates now, right now, these are the leadership skills you learn in your chapter with, with your brothers. Uh, the fraternity chapter is a learning laboratory that's not easily duplicated in the classroom or uh, in other campus organizations. As we know, the very word fraternity uh, comprises a group of brothers, not necessarily related by blood, but a group of brothers who support each other and live by the same code of conduct, their ritual. So if you choose to live your, by your ritual, you'll understand why your brothers who've made the same choice will be your lifelong friends. If you value those friendships as you go through life, they'll be among the very best you have. That's the reason you take the experience from the chapter to an alumnus uh, status and to an alumni um, organization, be it local, be it regional, be it serve on the national board. When I talk to fraternity uh, chapters, either AAPI or some of the other chapter, uh, some of the other conventions that I've gone to and uh, spoken at, um, that's, what I, that's this is what I tell them that uh, the opportunities are there if you take them. And if you choose not to take those opportunities, your life will be vastly different because all the other organizations that you touch in your life and the people that you touch in your life will not have the benefit of the fraternity experience that you had. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, I told you this before, but I certainly admire your body of work uh, it seems like over a lifetime, you've really focused on things that you truly enjoy, uh, whether it be the fraternity, whether it be Judaism, the things that are really important to you, you've been involved in them heavily. So, you know, looking back at it now, is there anything that you would have done differently? 
Probably uh, invested in Amazon at 319. <laughs> yes, you and me both. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I enjoyed my fraternity experience. The body of work stands on its own. And uh, there really is very little that I would do differently. Certainly, um, fraternity allowed me to uh, the opportunity to go to Omaha, Nebraska and visit a chapter there where I met my wife um, and uh, would not, I can't conceive of having any other reason to have gone to Omaha from Detroit unless I was visiting our chapter at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, and uh, got fixed up with this uh, lovely young lady. And uh, she, uh, we will be celebrating our 50th anniversary uh, in 2019. Congratulations. That Thank is you. absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, a great example of what happens when you start to step outside of your own chapter, start to get involved with other chapters around the country, meeting new alumni, uh, meeting new people. Uh, so it opens up a whole new world and certainly it did for you as well. So that's wonderful. Now, for the course, record, I want, I'm glad that this is uh, being videotaped because for the record, uh, I mentioned my wife at least twice uh, today. <laughs> That's important. You did a good That's job. <laughs> That's how you get to 50 years. Are you kidding? That's right. I've learned that as well. That's fantastic. So, of course, here at Fraternity Foodie, we love to eat. So, I want to know, what is your favorite meal and where can we go to get that? Well, you mentioned that at the very beginning and I, I, my mind was racing. Where, where, where's my favorite meal? I was in Detroit a couple of weeks ago to visit my brother. And um, I had my favorite meal. I, I would guess it's my favorite meal. It goes back to my childhood uh, memories. And that is a uh, uh, pastrami sandwich on rye. And in Detroit, that's really a classic sandwich uh, with, a, with a hard crusted rye. So it's like a New York deli. Uh, I was at the bread basket, which is an old style Detroit deli um, right out of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, yes, there are other delis in town that people go to because now they have more money and they can go to the stage and they can go to other places. But I go back to the breadbasket because that reminds me of my youth and uh, beef, beef and barley soup and half pastrami sandwich because I their sandwiches are this big and I can't do that anymore. Right. But a barley soup and half pastrami sandwich at the breadbasket deli in Oak Park, Michigan. There, There you go. That sounds perfect. I'll take you to a few in New York City that will also be just as good, if not better. Maybe. Chances, and I've been to the stage of Blessed Memory and the Carnegie and oh, so yeah. been to all of those and, oh, uh, yeah. and Second Avenue Deli. But uh, I, I like the bread best. Yeah, that is fantastic and certainly something that I miss here in Nashville. I just can't get a pastrami sandwich like you do at some of these places. That's true. And in Nashville, they serve it on white bread. So. <laughs> right. It's not the same. <laughs> All right. So if any of our listeners today want to connect with you, is there a place that they can go to connect with you? Maybe social media or email or any way to reach you? Uh, I am on, I'm, I'm on Facebook, uh, Sydney, uh, Sydney Dunn on Facebook. Um, if they want to email, it would be Sid at AEPI.org. That's the shortest email that I can give. Uh, S I D at AEPI.org. And, um, it'll get to me. Uh, so, uh, would be happy to exchange ideas with anyone. Always willing to learn and always uh, enjoy teaching. I think that's fantastic. And I've adopted the same philosophy. So that's, uh, that's excellent. I have to tell you, Sid, uh, the fraternity community, we are all very fortunate to have someone like you as a leader among us. I think that we don't get to this point unless we have leaders like you that are helping us find our way. So your commitment to fraternity, your contributions, not only to AEPI, but also to the greater fraternity movement has been substantial. And uh, I, for one, want to say thank you on behalf of everybody, uh, not only at FEA, but within AEPI and, and the whole fraternal community. We're all truly in debt to you and, and we appreciate the work that you've done. Well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Um, all these really nice things you said, my mother's not here to hear them, but if she were, she'd be, um, as we say in Yiddish, she'd be quelling. So she'd be just, uh, just joyous. Yeah. So thank you very much for that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And thank you to our audience for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on an upcoming edition of Fraternity Foodie. And bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.